Oh. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We've got a webinar with presenter Mark Garlinghouse from The Lens. And Mark is responsible for business development at The Lens. And The Lens is a platform that includes 111 million patent records, as well as metadata from 200 million scholarly records. Um, which are compiled from Microsoft Academic, PubMed and Crossref and enhanced with paywall open access information. So we're looking forward to getting an overview from Mark um, as well as a demo and some searches that are of interest to libraries and researchers. Um, we're recording the session, we'll share the recording, we'll also share the slides at, afterwards. Um, so you don't need to take too many notes. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll try and monitor as we go and stop for questions halfway or maybe just at the end. Um, thank you so much, Mark. It's all yours. Great. Thank you very much um, for that introduction and thanks to the entire um, IEFL team for making today's event possible. And especially thanks to all of you uh, for dialing in right now. I hope that you are safe and healthy um, from wherever you're you're joining us today. I'm sitting in uh, Singapore right now and um, we'll, we'll go through uh, some slides uh, introducing the lens. But before I do that, I wanted to um, say that it's especially gratifying, um, excuse me, uh, it's especially gratifying to me um, to participate in this event because um, IEFL and the lens are so uh, mission aligned. The IFL strategic plan states that its, mission, its vision is a world in which all people have the knowledge they need to achieve their full potential. I, think, I can think of few things that are more meaningful than this as a vision. The lens is a project of the social enterprise Cambia. Uh, the mission of Cambia is more utilitarian than the mission of Eiffel. Um, our objective is to help solve the problem of problem solving by making each actor or participant in the innovation ecosystem more productive at what they do. The mission of the lens, like Eiffel, is to support the potential of each individual and importantly, to be an amplifier of that potential, a multiplier or a lever for that potential. Foundationally, the lens believes that the planet faces many challenges. So many challenges that we need participation and support from everyone to address and solve these problems. So the lens exists to provide inclusive access to knowledge in an open and transparent way. Only with inclusive access will we benefit from the ingenuity of all people in the innovation ecosystem in a way that helps to address the challenges that we face collectively. So I'll segment today's talk into three parts. Um, an introduction to the lens with some slides that, um, as was mentioned before, we'll be able to share after the uh, presentation. I'll pro provide an overview of the lens.org platform, showing two case studies, and then introducing some key functionality on the platform. And finally, uh, finish with any questions um, that all of you have. Please note that unregistered use of lens.org is completely free and open. Uh, you're welcome to go to lens.org right now and follow along with my examples um, as long as you promise to keep me running in the background. So what is the lens? It's a lot of different things to different people. And I hope that after today's uh, introduction, the lens means something very specific to help you to do your job more effectively. As I mentioned earlier, the Lens is a project of Cambia, a social enterprise whose mission is to democratize real world problem solving. The Lens exists to promote inclusivity by making knowledge accessible as a public good that is shareable and reusable. The Lens was developed through philanthropic support and investment from organizations that support its mission. The Lens provides discovery, analytics, and research management tools on top of a comprehensive collection of scholarly literature, metadata, and patent literature linked through citations. In the examples and in the q and I'll try to go through exactly what we mean by discovery, analytics, and research management or metrics. It's worth noting here that we're big advocates of open and acknowledge that open can mean different things to different people. Uh, but I'm puzzled that while the world talks about open access for 
journal literature, and even talks about programs for open science. There's little attention paid to open metrics, and we collectively continue to use closed proprietary tools for metrics and research assessment. So the ideas behind the lens were conceived with contributions from many dedicated individuals. The founder, Richard Jefferson, is a highly cited biologist who did some of his original research in the late 1980s on transgenic agriculture. After he did his research, he wrote a couple of patents, um, realizing that the application of his research um, would be significant in the agriculture industry. And he had intended for this technology to be widely used across a number of different actors. Uh, he tried to start a program called Open Source Biology uh, to get um, all of that started. Um, that didn't take off as he had hoped. Um, he was pleased that the technology was adopted um, by one company in particular that was well equipped with the tools they needed to pay attention and realize the technology was, uh, was being developed to have a, an IP team who could write patents uh, to protect the IP they were creating, and then a manufacturing group that could go ahead and develop it. Uh, that company was Monsanto, and they turned it into a portfolio of, um, of products in the Roundup Ready product line, and it's had a real impact on society. So Richard was, was pleased that it had that impact, uh, but he reflected and said, well, that wasn't exactly what he had intended to happen. Um, he had hoped that there would be many different players who would participate. He observed that there were a couple of problems that he could help to resolve. One was helping researchers to be better aware of how the innovation ecosystem functions. Uh, and another was to make the patent corpus, make patent information more accessible while people are doing their research. Um, the linkages between research and, and patents are there, uh, but not many people are mining that information to draw insights. So in 2001, the patent lens was launched um, as the world's first free and open full text patent platform. Over the next 10 years, the lens team continued to enhance uh, the lens platform uh, with new metadata and new content sources. They extracted every gene sequence mentioned in the patents in order to make um, the patent literature fully searchable um, by sequence. In 2014, as a, uh, as a consequence of questions and requests they had from their users about adding non-patent literature, they aggregated um, scholarly works and included that in the, the Lens platform linked to the patent information and rebranded the whole platform as just the Lens. The Lens has been up and operating for 20 years now um, on a 24 seven basis and uniquely the lens ensures privacy and confidentiality of, um, of its use for all participants. No part of our business model depends on profiling our users or reselling information about how they're using uh, the, the, the platform. Uh, we think this is an important uh, differentiating characteristic um, that reassures users that what they're doing is private. So I'll go through the two different content sets that make up the lens platform. The first is the scholarly works. The scholarly data is uh, aggregated and deduplicated from four main sources. Those four main sources are Microsoft Academic, Crossref, PubMed, and Core. From this, uh, this set, we create a, uh, we, we have a set of almost 230 million records of which about half are journal articles. We extract information and metadata from each of those sets, and I'll describe in more detail in just a minute about how we do that. Um, but I'd like to note that we extract 1.7 billion scholarly citations or references, which help us to create the citation metrics for the scholarly works counts and the linkages to the patents. The patent data is extracted from um, five primary sources. Uh, we have full text from uh, the USPTO, EPO, WIPO, and the Australian Patent Office. And we have the DocDB patent file, which helps us to get bibliographic information from a total of 105 different jurisdictions. Um, as I mentioned early, earlier, we do some unique things with uh, indexing um, to um, extract gene sequences mentioned in patents. And we also link patent families. 
What we think we do uniquely um, that's aligned to our mission is break down silos of participate participants and uh, knowledge inputs to the innovation ecosystem. So these silos of content, scholarly works and patents have uh, a variety of natural links. Those include the uh, cognitive value add that's come from an author when they choose a reference, which might be to a patent. It comes from the same um, human intelligence for the inventor when they reference a paper in their invention or the patent examiner who may uh, reference other patents as well as uh, scholarly literature. The uh, participants in both of these different content sets are also frequently the same. An author and an inventor might be the same person. So we have initiatives underway to disambiguate and link those, um, those individuals. Similarly, uh, organizations, universities, and, um, and even companies uh, may be both the affi author affiliation for a scholarly work as well as the applicant or owner of a patent. In all, from these two different uh, uh, content sets, we extract 2.4 billion document linkages, uh, which again, help our users to mine the insights that they're looking for. I uh, mentioned the meta record strategy just briefly uh, when I was talking about how we ingest and deduplicate the four main, uh, the four, uh, main uh, scholarly work sources. What we do is build a uh, meta record around the deduplicated scholarly works. We believe that each of our sources has unique metadata facets that they can contribute. And we wanna maintain all of that metadata um, that each of the sources provides. We then have a, a single lens ID, which links to the unique work. And we uh, include all of the metadata, even when that's duplicated um, and link it to the provenance. We have rules that help us to, um, to resolve conflicts. If two different sources have different information about an affiliation or an author, for example, and it, we're able to maintain provenance so that if we get feedback that those rules uh, need to be improved, we can. There's a paper describing um, this lens meta record approach here. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we can share these slides. I realize you can't click through the, um, the Zoom screen. So on the back of those two different content sets, the scholarly works and the patents, we uh, create a, a set of apps that are on the lens.org open platform. Uh, the lens uh, content is accessible through an API or the, um, the web interface. We have management tools that enable users to create collections and reports to help them to, um, to curate data sets and then share and reuse that information. The five apps that we create on those two content sets are patents, scholarly works, uh, which provide discovery and analytics tools to mine those two corpus. We have PatSeq, which allows um, the uh, searching by a gene sequence of the patent literature. Pat site allows a search by a citation and inform is a tool that helps to uh, clearly show how an organization has influenced industry. So it's mapping we've created between organizations that are outputting research and organizations that are writing um, intellectual property from patents. We also have a couple of um, tools that uh, were, were uh, we're just getting in, ready to launch, which I want to mention. Uh, Lens Profiles is in beta. Um, I noticed on the Eiffel website that there was an ORCID seminar um, not long ago. There's a link here um, if you want to review that. But what the Lens has done is built an interface on top of uh, ORCID to make it more uh, accessible and, and usable. We are big fans of the ORCID uh, persistent identifier. And the feedback we were hearing from researchers first, when we were the, the um, when we were focused only on patent information, was how can I load my patents onto my ORCID profile? And then people realized that many of their scholarly works are already on Lens, so they just wanted to link those um, over to their ORCID profile as well. So we built a front end that allows you to create a Lens profile, and then it provides bidirectional syncing. Um, and updating of both sides of that. Um, we can go in to take a look at the lens uh, profile, which includes an analysis of the researcher uh, based on their scholarly works and their patents. 
institutional profiles are similar to lens profiles, but they focused on an organization instead of an individual, and they help that organization to showcase its capabilities. So we're aware that there's many organizations that do ranking globally. Um, and what we are trying to do is give the institutions an opportunity to showcase, uh, to tell their own story. Uh, we allow institutions to load digital objects on the front, and then we capture their scholarly profile from the research output and their innovation profile based on their patents and make that uh, visible uh, to the world. Um, so our focus, again, is on showcasing capabilities, uh, not just looking at a rank. And these capabilities are an indicator of future, future potential, um, not just uh, looking at uh, backward looking um, uh, characteristics, which define some of the rankings today. In form, I mentioned earlier, uh, it's an international industry uh, innovation influence mapping tool. Um, here's a screenshot of one example of research output from Carnegie Mellon and the patents that it has influenced. This, um, so Microsoft, IBM, NetApp, all heavy users of uh, output from Carnegie Mellon. You can also see a profile of the fields of use, the different technology areas that um, have been used. Uh, those are based on the CPC patent CPC codes. That goes through the slides introducing uh, the lens. Um, when I pass these slides to you, I encourage you to uh, check out a, uh, a, a seminar, a presentation given by Richard Jefferson, the founder of the Lens at the Skoll World Forum for Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, that's available through that link. And also the um, support uh, site of Lens can answer questions that, um, that you might have. So next I wanna jump into uh, the Lens platform. Um, I'm borrowing a, uh, an example that was put together by Aaron Tay. Aaron Tay is a librarian at Singapore Management University who runs a popular blog called Musings About Librarianship. For Open Access Week last year, he created a dashboard on uh, Lens to help organizations to track their open access rates. So we're gonna click through to see what exactly he had built. So he created a dashboard, which is um, shareable and customizable, has the, the name SMU Journals 2000 to present. We're gonna look quickly at the filters that he used to create this search. He did a date range of 2000 to 2020. He um, disambiguated the name of Singapore Management University with those two choices. And he limited the search to only journal articles. The scholarly works covers more than journal articles, as you saw in the slides. Uh, but from a, for an open access analysis, it's only um, it's only sensible to, to focus on the journals. Um, so from this set, he got four thousand four hundred works. Um, he can see that sixty seven of those works are cited by a total of one hundred and forty one patents. We could go in and analyze those patents if we want to, and we'll do that with another search in just a minute. Um, but the 4,000 works were cited a total of 108,000 times. Now, what's interesting here is the dashboard that he built. So he wanted to look at open access versus non-open access documents by year of publication. He wanted to look more granularly at the OA colors. He showed the average citations of the output by OA and non-OA sources, and he segmented those by the um, uh, by the, the OA color as well. He segmented by fields of study, saying, well, is our open access output different in different um, departments, for example? And he can look at different um, funding, different, the OA open access status by the funding source. Uh, he looked at the publisher sources as well, and uh, a breakdown of field of study, and then he analyzed the top uh, 1,000 cited papers. So what we're looking at right now is what we call a dashboard, and it's made up of these individual charts. Each chart is fully configurable. In this case, just to illustrate this, I want to change from a stacked bar chart to a line chart to show how it shows a slightly different story. In this stacked bar, you couldn't clearly see how these changes were happening over time. 
Now, I, I happen to know that in SMU's case, um, this was not a spike in non-OA publishing, but it was a uh, it was normal uh, publishing activity that they were doing in journals that were embargoed for the first year. So later, um, this number will come down and this number will go back up after the embargo and it changes those, um, those journals to uh, open access. So what I wanna do now is say, well, how can you customize this for your organization? I'm going to turn off the selections that we had here and clear that. I'm going to choose a, another country uh, to limit, uh, but you don't have to choose the company. We could go right into a country. You could go right into the institution if you chose. Let's look first at research output from Lithuania. Again, this is limited from uh, 2000 to 2020, and we're looking only at the um, at journals. Um, so we can scroll through here and again see the output from Lithuania with the similar analysis. I'm going to change the publication type to all publications so that we get a more complete set of output from Lithuania. Here we see the total number of works. We see the number of works that were cited by patents. Um, th there were a total of 3000 patents that cite these works. So that means there's multiple patents citing each one of them. I can look at the total number of citations of all the works that were cited uh, by other scholarly works as well. Um, if I want here, I can switch to a list view of all 43,000 papers. I can change the sorting um, to the most highly cited papers at the top if I prefer. If I want to export this list, I can export that. Um, if I want to save this as a collection, I can do that. And I'll talk about that in a, a few minutes. And if I want to share this, I can hit share and get a shortened URL to, um, to look at that. I'm going to um, flip back to the analysis because I want to show you how to uh, save a dashboard uh, that we've created here. Uh, but before I do that, I want to limit this not just to output from Lithuania, um, but a leading university in Lithuania, Lithuania um, Vilnius. So I'll click on Vilnius University. Now I'm limiting the output from the entire country to just the university. And you can see, well, this looks um, pretty good. I can look at the same analysis that we saw for SMU. I can um, look at, I can analyze co-authors from the list. Uh, but there's one problem here, it's still labeled SMU. So we will hit save the dashboard and we'll change this from SMU um, journals. And actually it's not um, correct that it's journals anymore because it's all output. So I'll say Vilnius um, scholarly output 2000 to present. And I can choose to make this publicly discoverable or not. I'm going to turn that off uh, for now, and I'll save this as new. Now you'll see it's uh, renamed that, and I have a, although it's not publicly discoverable, it is publicly shareable, so I can click on this, save it to my dashboard, my clipboard, excuse me, and uh, send this to anyone. Anyone can link on it and see exactly what we're seeing here. So we've shown you example of um, open access analysis and why the, and using that template uh, developed by Aaron Tay, uh, we morphed that into a snapshot of Lithuania, Lithuania's output. We um, looked at Vilnius University's output. Uh, before I move on to one other example uh, and show you some of the features, the, the filter and work area in the database, I wanna just show you um, the citing patents. Um, so we're, we're looking now at the patents that are citing the research output from Vilnius University, these 2,600 patents. We're bringing up a list of the uh, patent applicants for those. So we've got the um, patent list here. 
I can group these by families if I choose. A patent family are, um, is the same patent that was filed in multiple jurisdiction. This simplifies the list somewhat. Um, it still gives us a summary of the applicants. It's interesting that a couple of universities appear on this list, um, showing that Vilnius, uh, well, these universities may or may not have a, an active um, partnership with Vilnius University. Um, Broad Institute of these companies would be examples of people who are using research output from Vilnius and may or may not have a partnership. So for a, a tool that helps organizations to plan their futures, if you know that organizations, other organizations are citing your work in their patents, it might be worthwhile to contact them and look for a research collaboration so that rather than citing your, um, your research output that might have been your ideas from two years ago, they can partner with you today and tap into the brains um, that you have today. So let me go into the platform and just step through a couple of the basic features in the database. Um, so it's important that you are always aware of which app you are in. Um, the patents is useful for searching the patents and has unique tools to do that. Scholarly Works has unique tools for searching the Scholarly Works. We're looking at the Scholarly Works now. There are filters available to help to assist your uh, searching, but you can also put together a structured search um, but that's field specific. So I can limit by the field that I want to search, and you can scroll through this list to see all of the searchable fields. I can use a query text editor if I prefer to be more um, precise with those searches and be a little bit faster. But these filters will give you a good idea of what information is accessible um, to use. And aligned to the commitment of the lens towards open and transparency, we like to have these flags <clears throat> which help to make it very clear to you uh, what data is accessible. Um, so for example, uh, more than half of the works don't have an abstract. So we don't want you to get a false drop by searching on an abstract and expecting to find something and not getting it. Uh, we have um, about three and a half million documents where we've indexed a full text. Um, and you can go through and be very familiar with what metadata is available. The second um, function that I want to call your attention to is the work area. Um, the work area is a, um, is a set of tools that help you to manage your work. So I'm signed in here, um, but everything I've done so far, I could have done as an anonymous user. Um, uh, I'm signed in, and so it's kept a history of all the searches that I've done. And this might be useful for me to go back and refer to um, searches that I that, I, um, that I, I need to reference again. I can um, check out the dashboards that I've created and go back and look at those. I just created this uh, Vilnius scholarly output collection. Although it's private, I can still get a link uh, back to it and share that. Um, and there's other tools that you can um, use to manage and share your information. Okay, with that, brief overview, I'm going to go into, um, I'm gonna go back here and show you the patent um, output. Right? So the idea is, uh, or the question that you might be faced with is to do a company analysis um, of the research output and patent portfolio um, of a company. In this case, Sasol, a multinational headquartered in South Africa, uh, with about 30,000 employees around the world, has a, uh, an impressive patent portfolio. In preparation for this call, I tried to disambiguate the name variants that exist for Sasol and did a search and found uh, 4,000 patents from 734 families. And then I can analyze their research uh, or the patent output that they have. So this gives a, an idea of what their patenting behavior has been over time. I can see the top patent classifications by the CPC area to give you an idea about the technology that they're patenting. I can look at the top inventors appearing on their patent um, filings. I can look at the jurisdictions that they've been focused on. And um, importantly, I can analyze that patent portfolio looking at what um, has been, what's highly cited. 
So you can see that there's a couple of uh, patents that have been very highly cited. And I can go in and drill into what those technologies are that perhaps Sasol has uniquely. So I want to show you one other example of um, how to analyze what um, Sasol's research output is. So now I've linked not to the patent data set, but to the scholarly works. Um, Sasol has almost 1,000 papers um, that authors have identified themselves with. And there's um, about 10% uh, of those have been cited by patents. And we have a, the set of patents here. So I can look at um, an analysis of those, um, of those patents. I'm sorry, of those um, scholarly works. Um, this is a chronology of their output. This is the collaborating institutions looking at co-authorship. This is the journals where they're publishing, the top fields of study, um, the top journal subjects um, by the fields of study um, that's extracted from MAG and the top publishers. Um, so it, the use case here, do a quick analysis of research output from a company whether that's a competitive analysis or a, um, an overview of, um, uh, of the output from one organization that you're interested in partnering with, you can get a pretty quick idea of what kinds of, um, of things that they're working on. Um, so we've, we've gone through the filters, we've gone through the work area. Um, I want to take a look at lens profiles before I open it up for questions. Um, I mentioned that the lens profiles is effectively a front end for um, the ORCID permanent identifiers for authors. Um, the, the problem we were trying to solve initially was how to help authors to capture um, patents in their, um, in their profiles, in their, their scholarly works. So this wasn't easy to do. So we uh, built a front end for it and then decided that um, it would be helpful to researchers to update their ORCID profiles from the lens. What I'm going to do is look for a profile here. Richard Jefferson, I mentioned earlier, is the, the founder of uh, Cambia um, and the, the lens project. He's already linked his lens profile to, um, to his ORCID uh, profile. So this works really well. But even if you're not linked, um, you can still get research results, and I can show you an example of that. Um, so the front end that we built gives some summary statistics about his scholarly output and his patents that are loaded in his profile today. We do some simple analysis about his um, open access publishing ratio and his H index. Um, we've captured uh, information that's accessible. Um, into an employment history, but if you claim your record, you're welcome to uh, personalize this on yourself. Um, that goes through a summary of what I had um, hoped to introduce you to. Um, if we get some time or if there's a question about lens reports, I'll dig into that, but I think I'll stop here for a moment and uh, see if there's any questions. Thanks a lot, Mark. That was excellent. And uh, our colleague from Fiji, Uche, has a question. So I promoted him to a panelist. And uh, if you unmute yourself, Uche, you should be able to speak. Uh, when you were presenting, he was trying to search for Fiji. And uh, I, I was also doing the same. And we couldn't find Fiji as, as a country. And there was also a colleague from Tunisia who was searching uh, in the dashboard for Tunisia. And um, that didn't work either. So maybe, well, Udia is unmuting. Uh, you could show Fiji and Tunisia. Yeah, I. Um... Okay, well, one. We have to. Huh. Um... Let me try one trick that a. Oh, actually, let me uh, let me not use the filter. Is um. 
and please ask your question, Odia. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for your presentation, and uh, thank you, Elena, uh, for giving me a chance to ask the question. Actually, that uh, first question, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Anna asked, that uh, I can't uh, find the Fiji, and my second question, how it is similar with the Scopus and uh, Cybel? Because uh, some of the similarities I can find uh, both uh, both uh, platform uh, they are looking the similarities as uh, as I can see your presentation. So how is differ and uh, and what are the benefits? Uh, thank you. Great. Um, thanks for that question. So the the primary difference is that uh, Lens.org is open and transparent and uh, Scopus is closed and proprietary. Um, so um, Scopus is widely used, so you could do a search and tell your friends that you did the search and they could do the same search. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so you may not have an access or not have an access problem, um, but the lens is open. So you can do a search, you can share that search with anyone and anyone can go in and take a look at your research results and, um, and verify what that is. Um, so we think this open and transparent approach um, is very important for inclusive access to information. Um, so that would be the primary difference. Um, in, in fairness, there are differences in the um, data coverage. Our, the, our approach to data coverage and their approach to data uh, coverage are different. Um, and uh, that uh, you could look back uh, to get more information about how they choose what they cover. Um, uh, as you know, we, or as I introduced, we cover uh, records that are captured from one of those four different sources. Uh, so for subscription, uh, we have to liaise with the EIFL or directly liaise with you, by the way? No, it's free. You, you don't need to subscribe. Oh, it's, it's, free. A free, it's a free tool. Okay, then it's okay. Thank you. So you can go and use it. Sir. Yeah, I encourage you to go in and use it. And um, so th there's no uh, complexity uh, uh, at all to that. Actually, I'm looking after, uh, uh, first we have to leave uh, because after a time uh, it's not to be charged because uh, some of the organization uh, the initially is free, but after some time, after one year or two years, they start charging. So that I'm a I'm, I'm little bit afraid about uh, this. Uh, um, okay, actually, that this is a good question, Udia. Thank you for asking. Because um, it, the the extended story about the lens is that our philanthropic funders are asking us for um, to work on a financial sustainability strategy, and we are creating um, paid services around the free to use core. Um, we have a a deep mission commitment to making um, everything we have. Uh, freely accessible. So what we're thinking about is that this is open content and we're working now on um, licensing the tool to commercial actors. Um, so if you're using it for a commercial purpose, we ask that um, you support the lens uh, financially or in some other, um, some other way um, to make it, uh, to help make the lens sustainable. Uh, we, we think that it's a good example of um, the digital abundance that um, this information can be made accessible to everyone. And, um, and I'm a big supporter of the Eiffel uh, vision when it comes to access to information. Um, but that digital abundance still has to be funded from somewhere. Um, so our strategy right now is to approach organizations that are using it commercially, get them to support so that we can support public good organizations around the world. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, that, uh, uh, like here, I'm working in Fiji National uh, University. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, you, how you uh, uh, look this university as a commercial or uh, uh, as an academic institution? Because uh, I'm, uh, I'm wondering that after, uh, after we uploading the uh, document, Mm, so who will migrate the data, uh, uh, your team, or uh, we have to migrate by ourselves? Um, well, so the, there were two questions in there, and I'm not sure I understood the second part of the question. So the first question uh, about universities. So universities um, are public good organizations, so we're, we're committed to um, making it accessible to you and your community. 
Um, the second question about migrating data, I don't think I understand. What data do you need to migrate? I don't know. Uh, in case of the dashboard, uh, why data? Uh, because each and every organization, some uh, they have some information or some data. If they are working with one platform and and they are looking to migrate one platform to another platform, uh, uh, because this platform is free. Uh, just like uh, if someone uh, subscribe Scopus, uh, any platform. If they are looking to migrate from one platform to this platform, so uh, it should be organized by us, or you can help us. How we deal in this way? Uh, yeah, we we will provide the tools. So for that institutional profiles, when that's launched, we will provide the tools for you to do it. Uh, we won't do it for you. Uh, we are talking to a couple of companies who are interested in setting up uh, businesses to do that for. Um, for third parties, and we're we're open and supportive of that uh, because we recognize that it, it's a, a service that universities might want to have, uh, but we don't do that. Okay, thank you so much. No, thanks for the questions. And, and uh, for the yeah, no PG and Tunisia, um, I know that this is a um, a known issue, and I know that we do have country data for both Fiji and Tunisia. So I'm going to have to follow up with uh, a commitment to build dashboards for both countries, because I'm very embarrassed that I can't uh, get into that right now. Thank you so much. No. Sir. I'm thinking that uh, the small country so that you remove the from your dashboard. Eh? No, that, no, 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 yeah, no. That's yeah, that's not... small, but important. So. Just... Yeah. Oh, here, here's Tunisia, though. <laughs> Tunisia is here. Um, OK, yeah, Tunisia is more uh, has a substantial research output, but I will check. Um, BG Udia, and I, I apologize that I can't get that to come up right now. So, Thank you so much. We also have four questions from um, our colleague Vyacheslav from um, Belarus National Library. So he was clarifying about an API. Uh, is it free? Uh, great question, too. Um, the API is free for evaluation purposes. Um, and uh, in most cases, it's paid after the evaluation. Um, so if you are interested in getting an access to getting access to the API, uh, you can do so. Um, the, the API allows you to do some really interesting analysis. So the, the API is absolutely useful. However, as I'm doing my job and talking to people about the API, lots of people are describing use cases that they could do on the lens.org platform and then just use the export uh, capability. So there's a, a limit uh, to the number of records that you uh, export. Um, uh, there's a limit of 50,000. So in this case, you're, we've got a hit set that's um, more than 200,000, but I could break this into chunks, say by reducing the, um, the time coverage, get less than 50,000. Hit export, uh, choose my file format, choose the fields I want, um, and then export those. Um, so if, if you'd like to trial the API, you're welcome to. Um, and we'll give you a 30-day trial um, with the limits that you see here. If you'd like to use it after that, um, then we ask uh, that you have a, a short conversation with us about your use case. And if it's a commercial use case, um, then we'll ask you to support the lens financially. Thank you. So Vyacheslav is asking uh, which IT platform is used for, for the lens. Great question. Um, in our commitment to being open, we have a great deal of information about our, um, our architecture and sources that's listed here on the website under about. Um, what software does the lens use? Um, this is a, a summary of the, um, of the technology stack that we use and a list of our data partners. Thanks a lot, sir. His next question is about, sir, do you have any licensed resources um, in the lens, sir? And I guess he means from uh, commercial uh, e-resources, sir, from um, journal subscriptions, for example. Um, 
Yeah, we, we don't. So our um, principle in building this has been to keep it open. And uh, we can only make this free to everyone if um, the content that we have, um, the, the, the source providers are also open. Um, so you can see that our, our permissions were, were extremely permissive. I think if you talk to some of the commercial providers that were mentioned earlier, and you said, hey, I want to download 50,000 records and share them with, with anyone, um, they would say, no, that's not part of your license. Um, so the, the content sources that we use, we have to make sure um, are aligned to the same um, open policies that we have, uh, whether that's CC BY or, or something similar, um, so that we can continue our commitment to making everything that we have open to our users. Thanks a lot, sir. And Vyacheslav is also asking, what is the difference between personal and institutional usage of the lens? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so what we're doing is um, this, this is actually, you know, to be uh, very clear with everybody, this is part of our um, financial sustainability strategy um, to create uh, lens for institutions. So what we're building is a uh, lens institutional toolkit, which provides a set of tools that institutions can use um, uh, for, for use cases that make sense for them. So I talked about some of those today, um, uh, but all of these tools are built on the, the open content that we talked about. Um, the tools include um, analysis tools like the profiles, um, portfolios are building, help you to build collections, uh, dashboards show analysis and reports I haven't talked about, but they're, um, they're summaries of specific technology areas. Um, so these tools are being, uh, being released. Um, they're not all released yet. And once released, they will, um, it will invite people to license the tools to use them. And we do have prices um, for those for, to license that information. Um, before I show you those prices, let me just um, show you this section really quickly to, that you can reference. There was a, a question earlier about um, how do I get access to this? And uh, we, we, we think about it that there's three levels of access. There's an anonymous user. So that's someone who's not uh, signed in and they go in and they can use um, the platform for anything they want. Um, there's a limit to the number of records you can export, uh, but all of the, the tools are there for you to use. The work area that I showed you earlier exists, but because you haven't identified yourself, we can't actually save your history or your collections or your dashboards uh, for the next time you come because you haven't identified yourself. The personal user means that you've registered. Um, that increases the export limits. It gives you the work area that will be maintained for next time you use it. Um, and then we ask if you're going to use it for commercial purposes that you support us. And then the institutional user that you asked about is this last category where we expect groups of people who want to collaborate to, to use it and they want access to some of those tools um, will use it. So the pricing for universities, so this is for public institutions, is tiered by the uh, research output. Um, and you can see those four different tiers. Um, alongside this, we do have what we are calling a, um, the lens equitable access policy that if uh, anyone um, needs access to these tools, but doesn't have the resources to, um, to pay that the suggested price, um, then we will either find a sponsor for you or we will subsidize it uh, from the lens. Thanks a lot, sir. We also have a couple of questions from Nancy. Uh, I can't find the possibility of filtering the bibliographic data to select them by language? Is it possible? Um, that's a good question. So if you want I to think... filter out by French, for example. Uh... Yeah, I think the answer is no. But um, let me just go back into the, I, I would check in the filters for the flags. And if there's not a language flag, I'll um, make a note of that. I think that we can't uh, do that right now. We are working on improving our um, our um, language user interfaces, which um, aren't um, working where we want them to work right now. Um, 
but we expect to have those um, enhanced over the next six months. Uh, but thank you for the question. I'll take that on as a um, upgrade idea. Thanks. And Nancy's also asking, uh, what is the source of uh, land subject classification? Yeah, great question. Um, so the subject matter classification on the Scully works and patents is different. Uh, the pat patents is pretty straightforward. It's the CPC and IPC codes from the patent offices. Uh, for the uh, Scully works, it's from several different sources. Um, we uh, adopt the mesh headings from the PubMed content. Uh, the fields of study comes primarily from the Microsoft academic uh, content. Chemical substance names um, is from PubMed. And, um, and then keywords we use more generally. Uh, but you can drill into to all of these in more detail. Thanks a lot. And there is a question from uh, Barola Ganyem. Is it possible to export the PDF article from the lens to M Mendeley Ref Works? Oh yeah, great question. And um, that reminds me that I, I could have done a better job with, um, with some of these examples. So let's go into a uh, record and we'll do that malaria search again. Um, because I want to show you not only how you can choose how to export, but also when you go into an individual record, um, there's links to full text where those are available. So if you have permissions to, um, to access that paper from your IP range or, uh, or another source, then you can do so. Um, so first to answer your question, um, I can export in RIS, I think is the, the RefWorks um, uh, file format. So you can easily export and up, upload those into your, uh, your choice of reference manager. And then just to look more carefully at what article information we have here, um, uh, so I've opened up, this is the most highly cited article on uh, the malaria topic. Um, and sorry, I need to move my um, Zoom thing on the other side. And then from here, I can, um, this happens to be an open access paper. I can click right here and go straight through to that. But let me show you where our um, sources links are. This is a, a summary of all the information we have. So if you want to go to the full text, a reliable way to do it is click on the uh, Crossref link, which um, links through the DOI resolver to the Elsevier website. I'm not a subscriber, although this is a, it was flagged as an open access document, so it should come up here in a minute. Um, it would give you, anyway, what I'm illustrating here is it gives you access to the full text. I'm not sure why that's not loading. Um, so we, we don't have, we, we don't serve any full text. We do index some of the uh, full text to make uh, articles more discoverable uh, where we can do that. Um, uh, but we uh, do link to full text, uh, whether that is open access or uh, closed. Um, and then whatever your permissions are from the publisher uh, will come into play to give you access to that. Thanks a lot, sir. There was also a comment from Felix from Malawi in the chat that he couldn't find Malawi as a country, although he could find some uh, researchers from Malawi. If you can find the researchers from them, you should be able to back into Malawi. This is a um, this is actually a, a an issue that I've seen come up before. Um, Oh, let's see. Let's, we got to go back and clear the search. So we're getting all 220 million Scholarly works. And um, I'll build dashboards for you too if I can't find Malawi. Nuts. Oh. Okay. Uh, do you have the name of the, the researcher? We can back into it that way because the affiliation might um get us the or anyway i'll i'll build a dashboard for malawi alongside fiji and share those um with you you, you uh arena you have their uh, contact I, I, information. uh felix dropped a name in a chat okay thank you so you can if you can copy it from uh, research your name oh okay let me um uh, open that 
Got it. Okay. So I'm going to just do this quickly. Uh, ordinarily, I'd want to limit that to affiliation, or sorry, to, um, to author name, but we'll, since you know he's in here, we'll pull him up. And Vyacheslav was asking, um, where do you have documentation about it? the lens? Like, is, is there a place he could go to to find uh, some more information? What's what's the best place to go for for the documentation? Great question. We do have a um, a support site. It's support.lens.org, and I'll flip over to that in just a minute. Um, let me look at the most recent document here. Um, and then see if we can get a country. Uh, University of Malawi, how can that not be coming up? Um, now I'm going to back into University of Malawi as the, um, let me clear this. Hmm. Okay, I'll um, I I apologize on both those, but I'll build some dashboard, some country dashboards for Malawi as well. Um, and then the the other question was about the support site. Let me um, show that real quick. You can go to support.lens.org um, has some uh, videos and uh, some FAQs further down. The knowledge base is a good source uh, with lots of information. It has a, a heavy bias towards uh, patents. If you're a biological researcher and um, have knowledge about gene sequences, then reviewing this information before um, going into the PatSeq data set would be helpful. Vyacheslav was asking, do you plan to add research data at some point to the lens? Yeah, great question. We're, we're um, thinking about the optimal way to do that. Um, so right now, we, there's a number of organizations that are doing a great job building uh, data repositories, and they're intending for those to be open. Um, so right now, our thinking is to use a collaborative and linking approach to that rather than trying to rebuild anything that's being done. Mark, do you think with the country data, as a follow-up, we could go through the list of Eiffel countries and see if there's any others that are missing and build dashboards yeah. for those? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, uh, th there's, th this has happened to me once before and it's something about um, the search uh, that a colleague of mine uh, showed me how to correct it. And, um, and, and I think once I remember exactly what that was, it's a, it's a workaround. But I think your idea to go through that is a good idea. In fact, what we could do is um, build with collaboration from some of the Eiffel team members, we could build a, um, I'm gonna turn off my screen for a second. We could build a report, a lens report of research output from all of the Eiffel countries. Um, I can show you how we've done this with, um, we have built them for other organizations in the past. Um, that would be really great. Yeah. And then there was a question whether you have content in French and obviously you do have, right? <laughs> Yeah, we do have um, content in French that is crawled by one of those four big sources, um, uh, but um, but I, I don't know how to limit to that. So that's so what we could do is um, we built this for universities in Australia. 
uh, that does a summary of the research output and then goes into um, a dashboard for every one of the universities in Australia. Um, so I think this would be what we could work with it, an Eiffel team member to, um, to do something like this. We'd probably start with something that is every country. And then if uh, the country teams had interest and initiative to build a similar dashboard uh, for each university, that could be an exciting project. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. Thanks a lot, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, that'd be great. There was also a question from Felix, uh, still about Malawi. Uh, the problem is that uh, University of Malawi has just been reorganized. And uh, for example, you still have uh, some research affiliated with uh, University of Malawi, but uh, now some of them are joining other universities. Uh, and uh, an example is um, Kamuzu University of Health Sciences which is a newly, well, you can say newly launched university. And is there a way to kind of link to researchers who published with the University of Malawi, but now with uh, Kamuzi University of Health Sciences uh, for, for their institutional profiles? What yeah, happens that is when, a, when universities merge? Or... That is a great question. And uh, Malawi is not the only place in the world that is, um, is, is wrestling with this. Um, so what we've tried to do, or what we're encouraging people to do is look at those um, institutional profiles as their opportunity to create the collection, which is the university, which they define as their university. Um, uh, so I can save all of this as a collection and say um, that this is the curated list that, that I'm I'm an administrator at University of Malawi, and I have authority to know what is and is not a paper from University of Malawi. So then I will save this as a collection. And I, for example, would say this is a credentialed um, uh, University of Malawi um, research. Then I would save this. I might make it publicly accessible. I'm not going to save it because I know it's not credentialed. Um, and from this list, you now have said we are the new medical um, university spin out from what was University of Malawi, and this is how we're defining ourselves. So that, that's our workarounds right now. Um, the data that we have, the affiliation data, is extracted from the four sources that we cover. Um, so that is the, uh, the affiliation source. We recognize that that affiliation um, is, is dynamic. And so we're open to working with the community to enhance um, enhance the data. Thanks a lot. And what's your contingency plan with Microsoft Academic? <laughs> Great question. Uh, well, so everyone for those... struggles with it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so for those of you who aren't aware, at the beginning of May, uh, Microsoft announced that they will discontinue Microsoft Academic at the end of this um, at the end of this calendar year. Um, Microsoft Academic and the, the whole Microsoft research team has been a terrific partner uh, to the Lens for uh, five or six years. So we've been working with them. Uh, in fact, the patent data that they have came from us. Um, so we're, we're in uh, active discussions with a number of community members about how to um, best manage this going forward. Um, we, uh, the, the Microsoft Academic graph data is important to us, uh, but we believe that the lens meta record is sufficiently resilient uh, that whatever the outcome of these discussions that are going on now, that we will be able to ingest uh, another open content set um, that will help to maintain the comprehensiveness of the lens going forward. Excellent. Thanks a lot, sir. Sorry, maybe last last question. I know that we went over time, but uh, there are still questions coming. Uh, I'm enjoying any... it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm glad that you're available. Vyacheslav is asking whether there is any human curation of data. Like, for example, if he spots any uh, mistakes and would like to correct. Or... Um, we, so th the answer is um, we, we do get lots of people who are reporting areas and we welcome those. Uh, we can't fix them one by one. Um, so where we see their systematic errors, we uh, figure out um, what is being done wrong and where so that we can, uh, we can fix that. We do have pretty good dialogue with our sources um, uh, to go back to them. And, and if they're uh, ingesting content with some error, 
that is creating a downstream error that they've been uh, responsive to uh, to change. Um, uh, and uh, going forward, we're trying to build ideas around these collections where first we'll make those um, publicly searchable um, uh, and, and then later we'll be able to re-ingest the, um, the metadata that uh, the collections creators are, are making about their collections. Um, so, so yeah, I guess there, there's several different parts to that answer. Uh, one is that if you have a concern about a specific record, um, we'll still take note of it. So you can send it to us, but we won't do anything about it um, in the short term. Uh, it will become part of a, a data set that we're analyzing to see if there's systematic errors. So uh, it's important. Um, and then longer term, we're looking at these other alternatives to try and increase the data quality in a very um, systematic way. Thanks a lot, sir. And, um, Vyacheslav is also asking about sir, accuracy of your the duplication uh, algorithm. Uh, how would you comment on that, sir? Um, we are we're always working on improving it, um, and so this is why awareness of the the problems is so important to us. Um, we have a, I, I mentioned, I think during the slides that we have a significant initiative underway to um, uh, harmonize authors and inventors, um, which is, is exciting. And in, in the process of doing that, it will deduplicate other, um, excuse me, parts of the name records um, that we're maintaining. Um, so yeah, if he's got some specific ideas, we're, we're um, open-minded about things that we need to do to improve. Yeah, I guess the challenge is with our organizational ladies because we we're still struggling with uh, with them. Um, I mean, organizations could be listed in different languages in different ways or uh, on papers patterns. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. probably the, the biggest challenge. Uh, I guess we have worked it for for authors. That's that's a way around, and there are different organizational ladies, but. Uh, um, I think there is still a way to go in that area. I don't see any other questions, sir. So let's maybe give one more minute, sir. If people still have burning questions and thanks a lot everyone for joining us and for asking questions and thanks Amelia and Mark for doing this webinar and for planning a follow-up uh, activity. It's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. awesome. It's really been my pleasure. I'm grateful that it uh, looks like we still have 50 people or more than yeah, about 50 people with us. So um, I'm um, inspired by your interest in the lens. And I encourage you to um, go into the tool and uh, take a look at both the Scholarly Works as well as the patents. If you get some time, go in and check out the lens reports. It's also in beta, but it represents a, uh, a direction that we're trying to go. Uh, with knowledge cartography and take a look at the links in the slides that I send through. Um, and I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. <laughs>